Have you heard of creatine? Of course you have. At least you have if you've listened to our channel for any length of time. The reason we talk about it so much is because we love it and it's essentially the most effective supplement on the market, or so we say. We decided it's time to give creatine its own video, dig into the finer details of this amazing compound and answer the big question, does creatine actually build muscle? While it's only come to be popular among athletes since the 1990s, creatine has been around for much longer. Much, much longer. In fact, creatine was first discovered way back in 1832 by the French philosopher and scientist Michel Eugène Chevreux. From there, it went through a long process of discoveries building off one another. For example, in 1847, the German chemist Justus von Liebig discovered that wild animals have more creatine in their muscles than their domestic cousins. This led to the conclusion that the levels of activity influenced the amount of creatine produced. So even 180 years ago, we knew creatine had an important relationship to physical activity. Supplementation was then found to increase creatine stores in animals in 1912, and eventually used for humans the first time in 1926. By the 1950s, it was clear that supplementation definitely had a positive effect on the human body. Then in the 1990s, athletes learned that they could get a competitive edge by taking creatine, and it's estimated that 80% of the athletes in the 1996 Atlanta Olympics supplemented with it. From there, its popularity and effectiveness have only grown. It's now one of the very few supplements that the majority of experts say athletes and lifters should use. With that said, we want to ask you, have you ever actually looked at the studies behind its use? Or have you ever heard a more detailed explanation of what exactly creatine is? Or why we even supplement with it? Well, you're going to now. The rest of this video is dedicated to the inner workings of creatine, so you can know the mechanisms behind the emergence of creatine as the most effective supplement on the market. In order to fully comprehend why creatine works in building muscle, notice we said why, not if it works, you need to know how it works. Understanding the mechanism is paramount to understanding its effectiveness. There's quite a bit going on, but trust us, once you fully understand it, you'll have no question if it builds muscle. Let's dig in. So the first thing you need to understand is that creatine is not a steroid or anything like that. In fact, it's not even a foreign substance. Right now, you and every single person has creatine in their body. In fact, if you didn't, you wouldn't be able to function at all. We'll get into that later, so let's move on with how it works. As we now know, creatine isn't a steroid, so what is it? Well, it's a non-proteinogenic amino acid, an amino acid that's not used in the formation of protein. While it's not used to form protein, it still has very special duties, as you'll soon see, but we'll tell you it has to do with building muscle. Due to its physiological role, the body will collect creatine in its natural stores through one of two pathways. The first pathway is through our diet. Creatine is only found in animal products, primarily red meat and fish. If you're an omnivore, meaning you eat meat and plants, about 50% of your stores will be collected this way through your diet. So what about vegans? Well, vegans will typically have significantly lower stores than meat eaters as they're stuck with only the second pathway to fill their stores, the internal synthesis of creatine from the amino acids, methionine, glycine, and arginine in the liver. Regardless, either from your diet or internal synthesis, creatine is then transported to your stores within your body. About 95% is stored in your muscles, with the remaining 5% being stored in the brain and testes. However, before it's stored, creatine goes through a reaction that adds a phosphate molecule, changing it into a compound known as phosphocreatine. It's this addition of the phosphate that makes creatine so important. Before we go further, we need to talk about another compound, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for short. ATP is known as your body's energy currency. It's responsible for providing energy for every single muscle contraction. As its name implies, adenosine triphosphate contains three phosphate compounds. When energy is required, one of these phosphate molecules will break off, which releases energy that can be used for muscle contraction. The problem here is that you have a finite amount of ATP, and every time an ATP molecule loses a phosphate to provide energy, it leaves a compound known as ADP, or adenosine diphosphate. The di indicates that it now only has two phosphate groups, so now it's not capable of providing energy. Remember what we said about a phosphate group being added to creatine? Well, you can probably guess why that's important now. When energy is required fast, the phosphate group from the phosphocreatine breaks off and it will donate it to a molecule of ADP, thus creating another molecule of ATP. Here, we need to note that this process specifically happens to provide energy for high-intense anaerobic events, 
such as lifting weights and sprinting. When it comes to aerobic training, there are other mechanisms to resynthesize ATP which are beyond the scope of this video. So in short, when energy is needed fast, the stored phosphocreatine is used to supply a phosphate molecule to ADP to form ATP which can then be used for energy. The thing is, just like our ATP, our creatine stores are also finite. Think of it like a gas tank. Depending on your diet, the average person's creatine stores are only 60 to 80 percent full. When creatine is used, this level drops, thus limiting your body's ability to continue performing high-intense events and forcing your body to slow down. And so, we have now arrived at why we supplement with creatine. By taking a creatine supplement, we're able to fill up our creatine stores to 100 percent. Having full creatine stores then allows us to perform more work in the gym. This equates to performing a couple more reps or the ability to add a little more weight. It basically allows us to increase our work volume. Now imagine if you could go to the gym and add 5 to 10 kilograms to your lifts or add a couple reps to all your lifts. What would happen? You'd get bigger and stronger. So it's this extra work that full creatine stores allow by way of greater energy that is then translated into more muscle, greater strength gains, and improvements in general athletic performance. Dr. Richard Kreider, the leading expert on creatine supplementation, summarizes the benefits of creatine supplementation, saying you can see the following benefits. Quote, Improve maximal power and strength, 5 to 15 percent. Work performed during sets of maximal effort muscle contractions, 5 to 15 percent. Single effort sprint performance, 1 to 5 percent and work performed during repetitive sprint performance, 5 to 15 percent. So, in a nutshell, creatine works by providing the body with a greater ability to synthesize more fuel to perform more work, which translates into greater adaptations, simple and effective. As you can see, creatine supplementation works because creatine works. It's like saying that filling up your gas tank before taking a drive will allow you to drive further. There's no debate, it just does. While we could stop there, there are actually more mechanisms by which creatine works. For example, it's been found that creatine supplementation can improve satellite cell signaling. Satellite cells are a type of specialized stem cell located on the periphery of muscle fibers, which is what gives them their names. Studies have shown that they play a key role in the growth, repair, and regeneration of skeletal muscle. Therefore, satellite cell signaling simply refers to an increase in the capability to communicate with each other, which in turn leads to better muscle recovery and growth. As creatine improves this signaling, the body is able to synthesize muscle more efficiently. In addition, creatine also increases cell hydration. Now, This one needs explanation, as a common criticism is that creatine makes you gain water weight. In truth, it does. However, this is actually a good thing. Let's keep in mind that your muscles are 75 percent water. What this means is that a bigger muscle is obviously going to hold more water. While there might be some water retention in the first week or so, in the long term, as your muscles grow, water retention is evened out in proportion to your muscle gain. This review from 2022 sums it up by saying, while there is some evidence to suggest that creatine supplementation increases water retention, primarily attributed to increases in intercellular volume, over the short term, there are several other studies suggesting it does not alter total body water, intra or extracellular, relative to muscle mass over long periods of time. More importantly, a hydrated cell is more anabolic. The exact mechanisms aren't fully understood, but researchers know the swelling of a cell signals anabolic growth. Therefore, creatine increases the hydration of the muscles, which then creates a more anabolic environment, which means bigger muscles. Yet another mechanism, creatine has also been found to be responsible for lowering myostatin levels. Myostatin is a protein that's in charge of regulating muscle growth, specifically by inhibiting it. In other words, having higher myostatin levels means less ability to grow muscle. However, as creatine lowers myostatin levels, it increases your body's ability to grow muscle. And we're not done yet. There's also evidence that creatine reduces protein breakdown as well as increasing the anabolic hormone IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor. Now, let's look closer at what all this means for you. For starters, creatine supplementation can improve your recovery. If you're a regular viewer of our channel, you'll know how often we speak about the importance of recovery, as it's one of the primary indicators of how much work you can do. If you can recover faster, you can do more work and see better results. Creatine does improve recovery, which actually happens through several mechanisms. After intense exercise, your body's glycogen stores will largely be depleted. 
In order to recover faster, it's imperative for you to restore these levels ASAP, and this is what creatine does. When taken with large amounts of carbohydrates, 50 to 90 grams, creatine will cause a better absorption of glucose. At the same time, it'll help maintain muscle glycogen levels during exercise. This is also one of the mechanisms by which creatine can help maintain performance levels during the initial phases of high-volume training, especially when compared to no supplementation. This allows you to perform more work, which again means more muscle. Working in unison with this is the fact that creatine also has been shown to decrease inflammatory markers. All of these work together to improve the recovery of athletes so they can work more. Another awesome benefit, especially for those who train in warm climates, is that it helps increase the tolerance to heat. Actually, this is another benefit that comes by way of the extra cell swelling. The extra hydration reduces the body's thermoregulatory and cardiovascular responses. For example, those who supplement with creatine while training in heat experience a lower sweat rate and lower internal temperatures. Still, these benefits can be seen to some degree in anybody who trains with high intensity. If you get hot while training, creatine can help. So now that you understand how it works and more of its mechanisms, we can take a closer look at what type of effect it has on the body. Probably the main reason people take creatine is to increase muscle mass. Interestingly, one of the older studies from 1999 has some of the most impressive results. It showed that when combined with a resistance training program, muscle fibers see two to three times more growth than without. Since then, we've had a plethora of new studies. After long-term supplementation, the average creatine user still gains about twice as much muscle mass when compared to non-users. This equates to an extra two to four kilograms. And to be clear, this is lean body mass, not just weight gain. It's pretty clear why this is. When we look at muscle hypertrophy, the greatest indicator of muscle growth is an increase in total volume. In fact, there is a clear dose response. As creatine allows more work, you can perform more volume and see more muscle growth. Due to its mechanisms, creatine is also highly effective at increasing strength, power, and general performance variables. In terms of strength, you can expect to see results pretty quickly, like in less than two weeks. Some users will see an added increase of 15% in their strength, while the average can expect to see an increase of 8%. We should note these gains seem to improve intermittent types of activities. As you're likely planning on using creatine for longer than two weeks, let's look at the long-term effects. First, in contrast to short-term, taking creatine long-term seems to allow a trainee to increase their overall work capacity through an extended period of time. The strength seems to include both maximal strength values and muscle endurance. For example, a group of powerlifters saw a significant increase in their 3 repetition maximum or 3RM bench press. The control group still saw significant increases in their 3RM by 2.5 kilograms. However, the creatine group saw an increase of 8.9 kilograms. In addition, the creatine group saw a 37% increase in maximum repetitions of 85% of their 3RM, while the control didn't even see a significant change. In another study, 19 resistance-trained men followed a 12-week training program, with half using creatine supplementation. At the end of the study, the creatine group saw a significantly greater increase across numerous tests. For example, they saw a greater increase in bench press of 24% versus 16% as well as squats of 32% versus 24%. It was also found that the creatine group saw a greater increase in the cross-sectional areas of type 1 muscle fibers, 35% versus 11%, type 2A muscle fibers, 36% versus 15%, and type 2AB, 35% versus 6%. At the same time, they also saw a greater increase in total gains of lean muscle mass, 6.3% versus 3.1%. We could go on and on, as the vast majority of studies on creatine see similar results. You should also understand that these increased adaptations transfer into an increase in actual athletic performance. To date, creatine has been tested on a plethora of athletes competing in very different sports. This includes resistance training, elite soccer training, canoe basic training, and plyometric training. Performance in all of these sports saw significant improvements. In terms of widespread consensus that creatine is an effective ergogenic aid, the ISSN, or International Society of Sports Nutrition, reports. Thus, a widespread consensus now exists in the scientific community that creatine supplementation can serve as an effective nutritional ergogenic aid that may benefit athletes involved in numerous sports as well as individuals involved in exercise training. 
But what about that one guy who said it actually doesn't work because he used it with no gains? Well, even though creatine is highly effective, there are such people as non-responders. These are people who see no benefits to creatine supplementation. The most likely cause of this is that their stores are already full due to their diet. Therefore, any extra supplementation is not absorbed as the stores are already full. The good news is that approximately 80% of people will see significant increases in creatine stores that are greater than 10%. Then 6.6% are quasi-responders, which means they'll see an increase of 5-10% to in their stores. The remaining 13.4% are non-responders, meaning they see less than 5% improvement. So there is an 80% chance you're going to see some awesome results. As you can easily get a month's supply for less than 20 bucks, it is very worth your while. So now we know that creatine works for the large majority of people. We're going to show you how to use creatine most effectively. Now remember when we talked about what taking creatine as a supplement ultimately does. It fills our body's creatine stores. This takes time to do. You can simply do this by taking a normal dose, which is 3 to 5 grams a day. However, this can take up to a whole month. Therefore, the most common practice is to perform a loading phase. A loading phase is 5 to 7 consecutive days in which you take 20 to 25 grams of creatine throughout your day. This will fill up your stores quickly. From there, you can then simply take a maintenance dose of 3 to 5 grams a day. Now, let's get back to your loading phase. Some people might claim gastric distress or other discomfort when taking so much. However, it's usually exacerbated when taking bigger loads. Therefore, you can break the 20 to 25 grams into as small a serving as you want throughout the day. In fact, you can do this for your maintenance dose as well if needed. As far as creatine timing, it doesn't really matter when you take creatine. A meta-analysis from 2018 suggests that taking creatine immediately after training may produce larger gains in muscle mass. However, subsequent studies report there is no clear time that produce greater benefits. With that said, we do think that taking creatine post-workout may be a good idea. This mainly comes down to the recovery aspect. Remember that taking creatine with carbs and protein can enhance the absorption of muscle glycogen. As many of you are already making a protein shake, it just makes sense to go ahead and dump a serving of creatine in as well. Now let's talk about different versions of creatine. The original type of creatine to hit the market was creatine monohydrate. At the same time, this is the type of creatine the vast amount of studies that report positive results used. However, as creatine has gained more and more attention over the years in the general population, it's become a big seller. As a result, different variations have been produced, all of which claim to be superior to creatine monohydrate, generally that it's better absorbed. This includes creatine ethyl ester, creatine hydrochloride, and buffered creatine. They also come with a higher price tag. The problem is that as of today, there's only been a small number of studies directly comparing these to creatine monohydrate, and those that have aren't impressive at all. The majority show no significant benefit. In fact, some studies even show that monohydrate actually results in greater changes in muscle creatine content. With that said, getting a quality creatine monohydrate or micronized creatine monohydrate is all you need. With all that in mind, creatine is now being studied for its benefits that reach much farther than just improving performance in the gym. Creatine has been found to mitigate muscle atrophy from immobilization or sarcopenia in the elderly. It's also been found to be a powerful neuroprotector and can improve cognition. And we're even looking at possible benefits for brain concussions. In fact, the list goes on and on and will likely continue to grow. This is why we say when it comes to creatine, if you're not taking it, you're missing out. Creatine is by far the most studied and most effective supplement on the market, and there is really no comparison. There's also very little, if any, debate. Due to its vast range of uses, just about everyone, lifters and non-lifters alike, can see some benefits from taking creatine. It can be a family affair, but in all seriousness, if you're interested in lifting and fitness, which you obviously are, we would strongly recommend you give creatine a go, especially as you now know how amazing it is.